All right, everybody. Welcome. My name is Peter Bick, and I'll be moderating the Untapped Potential of Soil panel. And we've got five quite varied people here, which is really cool. We've got a lot of different perspectives, a lot of different experiences, and we'll just see where this leads. We've got, I believe, an hour and a half, or maybe an hour and 25 minutes now. And so um, what we're going to do is everyone's going to have five minutes to give themselves, uh, to introduce themselves and, and really tell you what they're up to. I can guarantee you that they all could speak for 20 minutes and still not get a tenth of what they do. So the five minutes is a very tight uh, restriction, but here we go. So Elaine, let's start with you. Okay, I'm uh, Dr. Elaine Ingham. I'm from Corvallis, Oregon. I have a company called Soil Food Web Incorporated and we have laboratories around the world. So we've been looking at soil organisms and what they do and how they benefit plant production and then how that affects animal production all over the world. So you name it, we've probably been working with people in that place. Uh, the last time we um, summarized, uh, we're working with about 22 million acres worldwide. Um, any kind of ecosystem that you want to uh, talk about, we've probably got some research that we have done or we will be doing. Um, when you look at organisms in the soil, you need to understand that plants put out exudates, and exudates are what feed the bacteria and fungi, fungi that protect the root systems of that plant, prevent the diseases and pests from being able to find your plant or have any effect. Above ground, same thing. But below ground, those exudates going out grow specific bacteria and fungi the plant requires to make the enzymes to pull the nutrients from the sand, from the silt, the clay, the organic matter, the rocks, the pebble, the any of the inorganic material below ground. There is no soil on this planet that lacks the nutrients to grow plants. So why are you putting out inorganic fertilizers? Why are we putting out rock dust? Why are you putting on calcium sulfate or calcium carbonate, lime and gypsum? Why are we doing that? Your soil already contains such a massive amount of calcium, so much iron. There's nitrogen in those rocks. So why are we putting on those <laughs> nutrients? Whoa. So um, by using that, by getting the bacteria and fungi to grow, pull those nutrients out of the parent material, out of the rocks and pebbles, the the rivers and uh, the um, Sand, silt, and clay, a little distracted here. Um, I paused your talk, by the way. Okay, thank you. So um, the bacteria and fungi then pull those nutrients into their bodies. They're held, they're retained, they will not leach, they will not be lost. When your plant is not growing, you have to have those nutrients tied up in your bacteria and fungi. You then have to have the predators of the bacteria and fungi, the protozoa, the nematodes, the good guy nematodes, not the bad guy nematodes. Uh, the um, spiders, the um, microarthropods, the earthworms come along and eat those bacteria and fungi. And so right there at the surface of the root is being released the plant available forms of nutrients that your plant says, thank you very much, and takes up precisely what it needs. Everything's balanced because remember bacteria and fungi aren't just releasing nitrogen or phosphorus or whatever else. It's releasing all the nutrients that any organism on this planet requires in order to be able to grow. And so they're all released, the plant gets the full balance of everything that it requires. And any excess is taken up by those bacteria and fungi that are being fed by the plant because the plant is what's putting out the exudates to feed those organisms. So we need to understand these interactions and these processes. If we can get this nutrient cycling system going in the soil, our plants are not going to be stressed for, by a lack of nutrients. We do not need to add anything into our soil other than organic matter to feed the organisms. If we've destroyed the organisms in our soil by tillage, by the use of pesticides, by the use of inorganic fertilizers, then we're going to have to put those organisms back. Where are you going to find a source of the organisms indigenous to your soil? 
that grow under your temperature, your moistures, your cultivars of plants. You're going to have to grow your own, and it's called compost. Make your own compost, but it has to be properly made. The garbage that you go and get from the local municipal landfill making compost, that's not compost, that's putrefied organic matter. It will kill your plant. So don't pretend that that's going to make, give you much benefit, or if you go get that, you're going to have to fix it. Why buy something that you have to fix? So make your own compost from your own organic materials or leave your residues down on the ground and apply that good biology so it starts building soil once again. The USDA says it takes 100 years to build an inch of soil and that is laughable. I can build 30 feet worth of soil overnight. So I will be talking more about that in my session right after um, this at uh, 4 o'clock. 30 feet overnight? Yep. You have to have good compost. How much? 30 um, feet? You're going to need uh, probably about five, six tons per acre. Which is how deep? Uh, it's about um, two inches. And you're saying overnight? Are you honestly saying overnight? You'd stand yep. by that? And... I will build the structure. We will mm -hmm. get nutrient cycling going. We'll get the root systems of your plants going down that deep. How deep do the roots of your trees go? How deep do the roots of your grasses grow? And people think that these um, grasses only go down a couple inches. Excuse me. Any productive plant, any productive grass should have its roots down at least 10, 15, 20, 25 feet. And if your root systems are only going down this side, that far, you have sick plants. You're, you don't have soil. You've got dirt. The four-letter D word. Already. Already. So... Uh... Courtney White. <clears throat> Anybody hear me okay? Am I plugged in? Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, yeah, my name is Courtney White. I'm here from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, honored to be here. Uh, probably here for two reasons. One, I helped founded a, a nonprofit uh, organization in New Mexico called the Kivira Coalition, which I think some folks probably have heard of. Uh, works with ranchers and conservationists trying to find some common ground maybe some common soil, I guess, uh, between different, organ different kinds of uh, groups of people. Uh, more specifically, I I'm here because I wrote a, a book that was published uh, about a month and a half ago called Grass Soil Hope, about soil carbon. One of a number of publications have been out in the last uh, year or so, inspired by Dr. Ingram and some other folks. Uh, kind of, I'm no longer running the nonprofit. I'm, I see myself as a storyteller now. I think it's kind of a, the missing link in a lot of this. There's been some really, really fabulous science. There's been a lot of activism, a lot of policy stuff, a lot of practice on the ground. You've heard some, of, some about it this morning. Uh, I have found through about 15 years of working with various kinds of public that we're missing, the missing piece is how to communicate these stories more effectively, uh, particularly to what we call lay audiences, folks, the public we talked about a little bit uh, this morning, Dr. Say we talked about. Um, so I, I kind of took that as my mission to figure out how to kind of take these rather complex ideas, at least they seem complex on the surface, figure out how to kind of tell those stories. Uh, and so, so in the book that I, I follow a series of carbon pioneers, folks who are doing uh, carbon sequestration work, or carbon farmers, carbon ranching, in some senses they don't even know that they're building car uh, soil carbon, it's just through those practices, uh, through, through some science, uh, scientific work. I don't know if you're going to talk about glomalin later today or not. You know, the, kind of the, my heroes are microbiologists. You know, the things that have gone on below ground that most folks don't know anything about. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of great work above ground management. You've heard about some of it already. So, uh, through kind of my experience working with ranchers and farmers, uh, both kind of in the grass-fed world and the organic world, and then the research community, and then I come out of the environmental movement and. New Mexico, uh, and me in the very beginning, we're just trying to get ranchers and conservationists to talk to each other, stop fighting over these issues. Uh, and now we have, I believe, we found a lot of common cause. Again, or maybe common carbon, I guess, uh, kind of linking us all together uh, in, in various different ways. Food being one, water holding capacity to soils. I live in a dry state. 
under a pretty bad drought, not as bad as California. I don't know if folks saw the news this morning. Anybody here from California? 58% uh, of, the, of the state is now in exceptional drought. Exceptional drought. I mean, it's, it's breaking all the records. So water becomes a critical issue. Soils, it's all linked together. Uh, I think com uh, carbon is a common element for a lot of reasons. Uh, does a lot of things. And so I wrote a book about carbon, as did Judith. Uh, and just kind of look, kind of trying to link these things together and try to tell a, a story to a, a kind of a general public um, that has a lot of messages thrown at it these days. We keep talking about educating the public. That poor public, man, it's got to learn this, it's got to learn that, it's got to learn this other thing. So I'm trying to apply what skills I have towards the carbon storytelling part of uh, a, a, a big, complex, and fascinating and hopeful picture, I think. I don't know, we can talk. I like to dialogue with the audience and understand how we can help push that story forward. So we'll get that going. Thank you, Courtney. Um, what's the name of your book again? Uh, Grass, Soil, Hope: A Journey Through Carbon Country. And it's out just a month. Month and a half. Chelsea Green. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Well, um, um, it's, it's on the table in there. I think Judith's book as right. well. Excellent. So we'll be signing books later. I think. Perfect. So, so John, yeah. it's yours. Oh dear. Um, okay, now I'm really loud. Um, well, I uh, was a journalist. Um, my father's Chinese, my mother's American of Scottish descent, my wife is German, and in 1979 I moved to China and covered the rise of China from isolation and poverty for CBS News. Um, and then the collapse of the Soviet Union and international terrorism and that sort of thing. But in 1995, the World Bank asked me to go out and film the baseline study for the rehabilitation of China's Lus Plateau, which is uh, an area approximately the size of France. And it's the cradle of Chinese civilization and it was fundamentally ecologically destroyed. So, having seen all these geopolitical events from the front row, I began to look at human history. And I found that the things that we're focusing on in the news cycle are not important. And no one will remember the kings or the struggles or the, the horrible suffering that's going on. But they'll all be left with the ecological consequences of the decisions that we make. And uh, I followed the restoration process and made a film called Hope in a Changing Climate. Uh, it was premiered on the BBC just the day before the uh, Copenhagen Climate Conference. I think 87 million people around the world saw it. But that's nice, but Gamnyam style on the web has billions of viewers, so I, I think it's still obscure. Uh, about a week or two after this film, <laughs> Alan Savory gave me a call, and he said, he was very polite, I thought that was nice, and uh, he said, um, excellent film, and you're absolutely right that relentless grazing will destroy ecosystems. And then he said, you have to um, rethink the role of grazers and animals in restoration. So then I met Tony Lovell and went to Australia and took a look at some of the work that's being done. And it is truly wonderful. But back to the main part of my story, I, uh, I saw on the Lus Plateau that it's possible to rehabilitate large-scale damaged ecosystems. That there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the Earth. That long-term evolutionary trends toward total colonization of the planet by biological life, the processing of the air, the water, constant filtering, and uh, continuous regulation of the weather and the climate, creation of fertility, microbiologic communities, which both 
release nutrients from the geologic materials as well as recycle from the decaying remains of the, each generation of life laying down its body to nurture the next generation. I found that these are all intact. It's that human beings are interrupting these and, and you can't, it's not negotiable. <laughs> so you can't interrupt these trends without there being serious consequences. And I started looking at religious cosmologies. I've now been to 80 countries around the world looking at ecosystem function and dysfunction. I've received a number of uh, fellowships from different institutions to study, keep studying. I've been supported to continue to study, so I just keep studying. And uh, what I find now is that there are 7.2 billion people on the Earth, and we're adding about a billion people every 12 years. And so it's absolutely necessary to engage these people in mitigation and adaptation to climate change. If they are not included, it, it's, it's not possible to succeed. So we recently made a film called the Promise of the Commons. Um, all my films are available, so I do hope you'll all watch them and use them, share them. Um, we, uh, we found that uh, the poorest people on the earth are, I'm sorry, what do you, what do you I'm done? Saying, oh, well, <laughs> anyway, we're working on a new television series for, if, you, if you'll give me a moment. Um, called uh, Finding Common Ground, The Art of Healing the Earth. So I hope you'll all collaborate. We believe in collaboration. We're working with many organizations. I direct the Environmental Education Media Project since the middle of the 90s, and uh, I'm working with the Ecosystem Return Foundation, which is based in the Netherlands. Thank you very much, John. Lots of stuff to talk about with everybody so far. Judith, you want to go next? Sure, sure. Um, my name is Judith Schwartz, and I'm a journalist, and last year published a book called Cows Save the Planet and Other Improbable Ways of Restoring Soil to Heal the Earth, which looks at soil as a hub for our many environmental, economic, and social crises and for solutions. But for the moment, right now, I'm going to talk about soil and water. Uh-oh, I think, I think my glasses are needed. Sorry, this is a new thing. I'm not used to these glasses. OK, so while soil per, per se is not in the news, water is in the news a lot. Um, as Courtney mentioned, there's the drought. Um, there are floods. N many, many of our favorite natural disasters to write about and watch, watch learn about, see about on TV, star, water. Um, so, but the connection between water and the land, and even more specifically water and soil, tends not to be made. The basic fact to keep in mind, oh, am I, I might be jumping ahead, but all right, we've talked about soil carbon. Um, carbon is the main ingredient of soil organic matter. I mean, that's like the stuff that you want to be in the soil. For every soil carbon, 1% increase in soil carbon, that allows the land to store 16,000 gallons more per acre. That is hugely, hugely significant because when you can store the water on the land, that gives you resilience to floods and droughts. So if we look at political hotspots around the world, often you'll see that behind the ethnic tensions or um, international whatever it is, beneath it you have problems with water, usually the source, sourcing of water. And if you look beneath the water problems, you'll see land degradation. And the way that this connects to the soil, when people talk about water, like if we were in most public policy discussions of water, we're talking about what we might call blue water, which is waters in lakes and rivers, the ocean, just when you look at a map, what's colored blue. But in fact, two-thirds of rain becomes green water, 
which is water held in the soil. However, one can't keep that water on the land unless the soil can hold it. And yet, no one out there is speaking for green water. So let's speak for green water. Let's speak for the, keeping the water on the soil. So when we talk about just something that you know, I like to you know, help shift gears so that we move from a problem that we can't solve to a situation that we can work with. When we talk about water problems, the emphasis tends to be on floods and droughts, whether there's enough water falling from the sky or too much of it falling all at once. This leaves the impression that we're at the mercy of the elements. However, if we shift it and have a focus on land function, this gives us a sense of agency. Specifically, it draws our attention to the ways that we can enhance soil's ability to retain water, retain organic matter and microbial life, thereby offering resilience that I mentioned. Um, and another thing that I'd like to say is that many of the problems that we currently attribute to climate change are in fact the result of land degradation when we're talking about floods and droughts or um, hot plates or biodiversity biodiversity loss. A lot of this done, does come from land degradation, but generally in the news, at least in the US, we get stuck on this, you know, this terrible fill-in-the-blank hurricane um, or drought or whatever. Is this related to climate change? And we keep spinning and spinning and spinning, and we never look at, as Alan would say, the root causes. So I'll leave it at that. All right, thank you, Judith. And Seth. So, hi everyone, my name is Seth Itzcan, and I'm the president of a consultancy, consultancy called Planet Tech Associates. We look at trends and innovations for a regenerative future, and I'm also on the advisory board of a new group called Biodiversity for a Livable Climate. And this group specifically is created to have the conversation about how um, biology can be an ally in mitigating global warming as opposed to just a casualty. And I'm happy to say that um, Judith is on the advisory board with me on that organ with that organization. And uh, we have a conference coming up in November which I'll tell you more about in a minute. But first, I just want to say how uh, honored and, and happy I am to be here and I want to thank the, the Savory Institute and um, and all of you for choosing to be here right now, because I know there's some superstars um, in other sessions going on. Um, and um, so thank you for being here. And also, just to share the gratitude with being on this stage with, with so many wonderful people, all of whom have been an influence on me. Um, I attended uh, the Kivera 2010 um, uh, conference called the, the Carbon Ranch. And that was a, a life-changing experience for me, and that was uh, Courtney White's doing. Judith Schwartz uh, wrote that book called Cows Save the Planet, which is one of the best descriptions of this whole phenomena that I've ever seen. Um, uh, Elaine's work, The Soil Food Web, I've been you know, referring to that forever. John's films on the, on the restoration in the Lille's Plateau in China is hugely inspiring. I had no idea I was going to be on the panel with him. <laughs> Um, and then Peter's, Peter's work, I mean, you know him for um, the, um, the Carbon Nation, but he also has a new film called Soil Carbon Cowboys, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, so it's just a real honor to be here. So if I used up my five minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, so then, um, and thank you, Alan, for coming here. And um, so I just want to say, uh, I come at this wearing sort of two hats. One is as a, as a futurist. And that just means I'm interested in the trends impacting the future, um, but also as a climate activist. And that's really sort of how I got involved with this, was because I was interested in the role of biology to help mitigate global warming. And, um, and in 2011, Alan put out a call um, asking people to come to the ranch in Zimbabwe. It's called the Africa Center for holistic management. And um, so I went. 
And I was there for six weeks, two weeks longer than I anticipated I was going to be there. And it, it absolutely um, um, opened my eyes in terms of what was possible in terms of restoration. And um, uh, just fr from a personal experience, to stand in eyeball high perennial grass, you know, like, um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm blanking on the Latin name for the grass right now, but it'll, it'll come back to me. Uh, 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 a panicum maximum. Um, there you go. I had to look at Alan to get it. So, uh, you know, to be standing in, you know, eyeball high perennial grass in an area that only five or six years later was completely barren. I mean, completely barren. Um, that's just a profound experience. No one can ever take that away from me. No one can ever say, no, this doesn't work. I'm like, I'm sorry, I was standing in the efficacy of it. Um, and where there's perennial grasses, there's roots, there's carbon being sequestered. Um, and so I did some research on what the um, carbon sequestration potential might be. We can get into that more later, but the, the, the punchline is that it's much greater than is typically expressed in the literature because most restoration methodologies, um, particularly in sort of semi-arid grasslands, are minimally effective um, because they aren't using ruminants as part of the restoration paradigm. In fact, the typical um, treatment is, it's called um, exclusion. They actually take them out. Um, so I believe when ruminants are used properly, as, as we've seen, um, the carbon drawdown potential is much greater than is typical in the literature. And, uh, we can talk, I could throw out some numbers now or we could get to it later, but, but that's basically my thesis. And um, I've written a paper on that. And here's my, t I have my own timer, Peter. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, well, thank you, everybody. I, can, I wasn't texting, believe me. Um, <laughs> So, like I said, we're all very different up here. Obviously, the through line is we want to get soils thriving. And I think we all on this panel would say that cows are an essential element to getting the soils thriving. Are we all in agreement on that? So, Elaine, let's start with you. When you went to college, did you think that then? And then how did you get to that place where you came to see cows as a solution? Um, certainly when I went to college, uh, my father was a veterinarian, and so spent a big a, animal vet? An, big animal, okay. yeah, cattle, horses, things like that. University of Minnesota, head of the Department of Pharmacology and Physiology and Veterinary Medicine. Ooh. So um, I, he had taken me out on pasture, out on um, you know, discovery, and he usually sent me out to look for the uh, poisonous plants and report back to him why the cattle in the herd were actually dying. Uh, because they had nothing left to eat but the poisonous plants because they had overgrazed that soil so badly. And of course, then most of it's running down the hill. So going to college, I was definitely not going to go into uh, farms, anything to do with farms, because it had been so um, sorrowful. To were, were livestock the enemy at that point in your psyche? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Typical ecological, you know, take away the bad guy. They're, they're grazing all the land and not realizing that it's with the mismanagement of those animals. So um, it wasn't until I w had um, gone to St. Olaf College for my undergraduate degree. I was going to go to medical school, worked in a heart hospital for a while. Um, would never want to work on one species of organisms ever. So I went on to uh, marine microbiology. So marine, and then to Colorado State University, where um, working with the folks at the Natural Resource Ecology Lab, starting to realize that grazing animals managed properly were, were a very different story. And then, of course, all of the work that Alan's been doing over the years and reading and watching that. And that's you know, slowly impinged on me where I was looking at what's all this biology and what really controls what's going on in the soil and wasn't too many years ago, probably only three or four years ago that light bulbs finally came on and it's the plant that's in control of everything in the soil. You, it can't have the control if it doesn't have the 
uh, management tools. So you better have your bacteria and fungi, protozoa and nematodes. We have to understand the balance of those organisms and what the feedback is. But it's, you know, people always ask me, especially scientists, we're horrible at this. What's the most important thing? Mm -hmm. So, okay, what's the most important organ in your body? And I can take all of the rest of them, you don't need them. <laughs> you got the most important one. <laughs> But, of course, you can't live, you can't stay alive without everything working together. The soil is precisely the same way. Awesome. John, you raised your finger right when I asked that question of Elaine. Oh, well, you said cows. And I should have said livestock. I, I think said ungulates, maybe. Ungulates, okay. But let's, uh, same question to you. When did you, at one point in your life, did you think of livestock as, as detrimental to, well, you must have because Alan called you. Well. Not exactly. I, I, I'm not sure that Alan called me because I was totally wrong. <laughs> he was being tuck. He was being tuck. <laughs> oh, you mean I was totally wrong. <laughs> no. no um, what I started looking at was um, degraded ecosystems that had caused civilizations to fail. And Throughout history? Yeah, Throughout historically history? in different places around the world. So, But... What, uh, what you see is that grazing or relentless grazing is the end game. So it seems that de deforestation is the first thing which takes place. And then unsustainable agriculture is the second thing <laughs> that takes place. And then when that's exhausted everything, then they send in the, the cows. Well, they send in the goats uh -huh. and the sheep, primarily. I mean, cows. But when was the moment that you well, saw I, you a solution? Know, I'm, in, basically, in I was a hippie cameraman who went overseas, you know, to take pictures. So I wasn't someone who hated cows. You know, I didn't go overseas because I hated cows. I never hated cows. So let's get this straight. Mm -hmm. I never hated cows. <laughs> um, Duly noted. But, but, um, but. The idea that animals were extremely important in restoration definitely came through when I went to Australia with uh, Tony Lovell. But, and, and it, it picked uh, my interest when, when Alan called, so I, I'm open to suggestion. Um, yeah. Got it. Um, Courtney, you've probably had this conversation a lot with scientists. I, I've certainly started to have it a lot where they just absolutely know that there's no way to store very much carbon in the soil. They absolutely know that livestock is a problem. What do you do with that conversation? Have you had that conversation before? Yeah, well, yeah, this is a good question and one that's uh, caused uh, me some consternation over the years. Um, maybe I should back up a little bit. Uh, I, I come out of the environmental movement. I, I met a rancher, Jim, Jim Winder, who was really, we took a tour of his ranch in 1996 with a bunch of Sierra Club activists. And it wasn't about the cows so much, but Jim could answer, there's actually an anti-grazing activist on the tour. And Jim answered every one of his questions point by point, but he, but he talked about ecology. He was talking about cycling, he was talking about soil and water. It wasn't so much about the animal, the animal was his tool. But he knew more about the environment than any environmentalist on the tour. And this was, including me, and this was really kind of an eye-opening moment for me. And, uh, and, and so we, that was kind of the moment the light went on and we realized there were answers to, to a number of problems, including how to find that common ground between conservationists and ranchers. The answer was soil, grass, and water, and then the animals on top of it. Uh, and then we began this kind of long collaborative process. We've, we've done a lot of... Uh, creek restoration work, um, learning about riparian ecology and that sort of stuff. And I had to answer your question, to be, to be a little f frustrated over the years, missing from this kind of collaborative movement has been the research community. Um, I, and I don't entirely understand why. Uh, it's been a little bit of a source of frustration, particularly range ecologists. Um, uh, some get it, some don't. Uh, some folks some seem to dig in. I don't know if other, other folks are here from the research community. Uh, kind of a tribalism seems to seems to be at work here a little bit, um, uh, and th and then what's distressed me most of all is this kind of um, 
practitioner versus researcher gulf that uh, I don't understand entirely what it is about if you have dirt under your fingernails, then you don't know as much as folks who are in the research. So it's been a little frustrating, and I don't quite know the answer to that question. But there, there, there are points of contact there that need to be strengthened as this effort goes forward, and, and things have changed over the years. Mm -hmm. But I kind of went back through it again with the carbon thing. Oh, no, that's not true. No, you can't sequester that much carbon. But I think the point is that they're not looking, what Seth said, they're not looking at, at the kind of the suite of practices that do this. They tend to kind of um, sort of uh, buttonhole a certain kind of... Uh, a management practice in their minds and know that just gets you a little bit of this, not the big thing there. Right. Um, and that's just, it's just a, it's just a frustration. I don't, I don't, I don't understand why. Everybody's got some suggestions. Okay, I'd Judith, love to hear. Same question to you, because you're not in your head a lot. Yeah. What do yeah. you do when you talk to the scientist who knows what you're saying can't be true? Um, most of the scientists that I deal with are scientists that do understand this, and I'm trying to learn from them. However, people in the general public and particularly the, okay, the, what was making my head nod was the climate movement, most specifically, mm -hmm. when people say, no, 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 that doesn't work. No, we know exactly what's going on. And, right, the, the, the lack of openness to other other processes, to thinking about other processes, how they may interact with, with climate. There's a lot of closed-mindedness. And um, what was I going to say about the, Oh, what, um, I guess what, what, how I understand this is that, again, when we talk about not, how knowledge is divided in our culture, that the climate community, like every climate scientist that a journalist will go to, and this is where m people may get their information, is, is a physicist. It's climate is, the discussion around climate is, dri is driven by physics, just as the discussion around agriculture has been, until recently perhaps this is changing, has been driven by chemistry. And when Elaine said that most people think that it takes a thousand years to build an inch of soil, that's because that conversation has been driven by geology. So what's missing in all of these is biology. And for some reason, rather than saying, oh, I see, when you bring biology into the picture, then, then we get carbon. Oh, that makes sense. They just say, no, we know. Right. Now, you had a line about climate that I thought was so good at the Chicago Council when we were in DC when you spoke. Something about climate's not about the air. It's, right. What was your line? Do you remember it? Uh, you wrote it. I often say that climate is not just about, well, it's not just about the air. It's also about the ground. It's not just That's about it. physics. It's also about biology. I, I just love that line about climate's, you said it more definitively, I think. You said climate's not about air. It's about ground. That was great. Seth, um, along these lines, um, I know you've been frustrated by a lack of research. You did a meta-analysis of, I think, what you could find of, of the whole research. Where would you research right now? What, what do you think's missing? What are the, where would you fund research right now if you could write a check for X amount of dollars? Where would you put your money to research right now? Okay, um, I'm definitely gonna answer that question, but can I also answer the previous question about that transformation in my life? Sure. Um, you can answer that one. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I was a vegetarian for 11 years, and I was, back then it was called a macrobiotic, which is kind of like a vegan now, um, and I was a disciple of the, the diet for a small planet, and, um, you know, it made perfect sense that, that the, the, the meat industry was bad, but I, I never really hated cows, um, but I, I, I figured it was, well, this meat industry is bad, and we should, we should eat differently. Um, and, and really the, trans the, the beginning of that transformation happened almost 20 years ago. A, a colleague of mine named Jim Laurie took a class with Alan in, in Texas literally 20 years ago and he began talking to me about the buffalo herds and how there were 70 million buffalo and they would go between Mexico and Canada. I mean the, the U.S. was just a passing through 
That's how big the, the range was and how important that was to the, to the grasslands. And then I began to think, huh, okay. You know, they're not just animals, they're part of a system in ecology. You know, and then I started to kind of loosen up and then, you know, just about four years ago, I went to the Africa Center and I saw it for myself. So all right, that's just the answer to that question. In terms of where to put the funding, absolutely, the funding for research needs to go to the places that are doing holistic management, particularly places that are doing holistic management in highly degraded semi-arid semi regions, southern Africa, um, the, the Patagonia area. There's a project now starting in China in the Mongolia area. Like, absolutely, that's where the research has to go. And it has to go to places that are holistic management. They say, we are holistic management. It's being done under the auspices of the Savory Institute. There's a holistic management um, uh, practitioner who's, who's doing it. it. It has the checklist. There's a goal. It has the grazing plan. We can tell you where the livestock are going to be and when. Here's, here's our plan. Uh, getting back to the other things about the frustration, let me, let me keep Yeah, keep okay, fine. Around. So that's, the, that's where I would put the money. Okay. Highly degraded areas that are, that are indeed using holistic management. management. So John, you, you tapped me a little while ago. I just wanted to get around. Um, do, you wanna, do you wanna pick up where you were? Well, actually now I'm somewhere else, okay. but... Uh, <laughs> it happens. Uh, yeah. Um, I think that uh, what's being discussed is, is really something that I've noticed as well, that about... 700 years ago, there was a sort of transition away from knowledge being stored in the Western world in the Catholic monasteries, and the university system developed. And now the university system has is, is, is somehow become dogmatic, and it's, it's, the time is coming for another major transition in education. And what, what has happened is that you can't study climate or hydrology, or fertility, or, you know, with, without studying all of these issues. So, you know, microbiology, and botany, and atmospheric science, and hydrology, they're all the same. They don't exist in isolation. There's, it's, it's the organ issue. Which organ do you want? You know, you, you, can't, you can't do that. But we have. And now we've specialized to the point that it's irrelevant. So, it's now irrelevant to follow the, the minutia of these things because you have no idea of the whole. So we, we, have to, we have to see this. And fortunately, we're at this moment where technologically, basically everyone on the planet can have access to the sum of human knowledge if we make it happen. And so the university systems, <laughs> if they're not shaking in their boots, you know, then they, if they're not understanding what's happening, then they, they, they'd better. And other people around the world should get an idea because every child in, in sub-Saharan Africa or in Somaliland or wherever, Mali, Niger, you know, they can access the sum of human knowledge and they should because the next big, big thinkers are, are going to come from there. And we need to realize that, that they're not separate. It's not us and them, it's just us. And if they're not engaged, then we're not gonna succeed. So they must, they must come in, we must give them access to education. Great. Elaine, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get down into the soil right now. I was having a conversation with one of those scientists yesterday. He just led a paper that said that beef production is by far the worst thing for the planet of any protein. I don't know if it got a lot of press, this, this one report. And I was talking to him and he was telling me what couldn't happen, what couldn't happen, what couldn't happen. And then I told him about the science work that we're developing to do system science and he wanted to be on the team. So he just, and then he said, listen, I'm just jaded. <laughs> and, and so that, that's, it's been very interesting that once I say I want to do this system science work, just about everyone I've talked to is very excited by that idea, to your point, to your point, to your point. But what I couldn't definitively tell him and what I was asking him and what I think is right in your wheelhouse, is food more nutritious when the soil is thriving than if it's grown on soil that's not, whether it's organic or not? Can you talk to that? 
Absolutely, because if you don't have the life in the soil, actual real soil, there is no way to get the balance of all those nutrients into the plant, especially if you're going out and you're putting on inorganic fertilizers. You're only putting out one or two elements at most. And so you've just completely knocked that plant upside the head. You've overloaded it with nitrate or you've overloaded it with phosphate. It's going to consume excess of those things. And now your animal comes along and eats that plant and it's getting an overdose of nitrate in its system, which destroys things going on that are supposed to be happening in its rumen or in its digestive system. And then we eat that plant material or we eat that um, meat from that animal and we are not getting the balanced nutrition that we require. We're getting overloaded with one or two things to our detriment as well. So, yeah, as, you know, often with uh, ecologists that haven't really quite thought all of this through, um, they're looking at the fact that um, we as human beings should be eating the direct source. This, uh, you know, has the least amount of energy loss or carbon loss if we're eating the plant. If an animal comes along and eats the plant, then all of the energy of maintaining that animal, all of those uh, um, issues that it's got and keeping its health and hooves and eyeballs and bones is um, now being wasted. And so when we eat that animal, it's all this extra energy has been lost. It's inefficient in terms of taking up nutrients directly from the source. So. You know, never mind that you have a really hard time getting all the set of proteins that you need if you're not eating meat. It, you have to do a really strange diet, which no, I'm not interested at all. So that's, a, that's probably their point of view, that mm -hmm. yes. you know, it's, it's, it's inefficient, vegan. It's we should go directly to the source and eat plants. Mm -hmm. Yep, we talked about lentils and garbanzo beans. Mm -hmm. um, so Judith, what do you you're working on water now. Your next book is going to be about water. Are you talking about corn in your book about water? Probably. You don't know I, yet? I don't know yet. I really am just in the beginning okay. stages and just thinking through where I'll go, okay. who I'll talk so you're to. Right but at the if I'm if I'm going to the middle of the country, I will abs I will be addressing it. Yeah, cuz who here would like to speak to corn? within the beef production world? Nobody. Nobody. I don't have anything good to say about it, so. Okay. Well. Oh, you know what? Can I say something sure. about that? Not about corn, but alternatives to corn in terms of finishing beef. Okay, go for it. And so last time I was at the ranch in, uh, in Zimbabwe, some of the guests that were visiting were grass-fed and grass-finished ranchers from Pennsylvania. And they were selling an upscale meat product to the local markets. And they were saying, our beef is just as marbled and tastes just as good as the grain-finished beef. And, and it's only on, on grass. So that's the only thing I want to say about the corn thing. The corn is part of the finishing. And because of the innovation that's happening and because of the demand for grass-fed beef, some ranchers now are coming up with alternatives to grain. Well, basically, they're just finishing on grass really well. They're the, using the, the right the, genetics. They're, and... they're finishing on grass, but it's, they have a certain process that, 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 that makes that finishing, I, I mean, I don't know all the details of it, but, but it, it's slightly fermented grass. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, it's not just regular grass. Gotcha. But it's still just grass. Right. Okay. It's a process. Yeah. <clears throat> I was just um, filming in Missouri and Kansas and meeting some young farmers, 30, 32, 33, who are teaching their dads how to do things. And their, their starting point was a cover crop. I mean, yeah, their starting point was a cover crop. That's what got them thinking. And then when they started thinking about soil health, that's when they started thinking about livestock and how to move the livestock. It was just really exciting. Uh, it, it, I've been thinking that there's a missing link with the young and the old with this whole issue. And I'm just, I'm finding out that it's happening, that there's just 
an incredibly exciting new generation of farmers and ranchers that are really building on Alan's work and, and just really pushing it forward. So I'm sending, my, I'm sending their greetings to you right now because I was just at the grass-fed exchange. Yeah, Courtney. Uh, I can I make a pitch for a, maybe a non-agricultural side of this, sure. which is uh, uh, beaver, for example. I mean, uh, there's a role for wildlife, nature, Beaver, nature's carbon engineers, anything that promotes life in the soil and maintains. Uh, yep. um, is that me? Uh, you know, so things that that, that um, uh, increase uh, biological activity, that uh, beavers in the dams and the soils and the water and all that sort of stuff. It's uh, uh, they, they've done the measurements. It's pretty phenomenal. If you go back and look at the beaver population in North America, what. Uh, what, what we got, what we lost, really, and so bringing back natural systems, bringing back so key wildlife species, thinking about bees, all well, the bees and, and, and the pollinators at the bottom here, at the you know kind of the bottom up, not just the keystone species down. Mm -hmm. Thinking about ecological restoration, we've done a lot of creek work, uh, which is sort of sort of um, outside the, the agricultural context. So we t we tend to talk a lot about farming and ranching. Uh, young people, young farmers, young ranchers, all absolutely critical to the equation, but we tend sometimes forget about kind of the natural systems as well. well uh, with, they've, with got, the, they've got to be linked together. With the beavers, are you seeing beaver colonies restored? Are you seeing that kind of work happening? Uh, th there's a lot of effort underway. Uh, they understand the, the ecological role and now the carbon role. However, in, uh, where we are in drought, beaver are having a hard time. I mean, they need water. Uh, we've, I know of folks who've lost beaver co colonies to drought, and so it's, it, I mean, it's a complex picture. But we tend to, I do just kind of keep coming back to agriculture and food production when there's, there's other elements to the, the sort of the carbon universe that we, we tend to kind of overlook. Cool. So. John? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that the Chinese did, which was quite interesting, was not to use animals, sadly. Current or historical? Well, to, in the restoration of the Loose Plateau. Okay. So one of the things that they did was they used GIS systems to differentiate and designate ecological and economic land. And the ecological land ended up being more than the economic land. And okay. say, say that last thing again? The ecological land became more, more. than L larger, oh, okay. larger area mm. than the economic land. So they use some criteria, like if it's a if it's a traditional grassland, then it should be restored traditional grassland. And if it's a if it's a uh, slope over twenty five percent, then it's got to be removed. If it can't be terraced, then it's got to be removed from agriculture. And what this did was that it it allowed some space. So without really necessarily actively reforesting everything, natural vegetation could come back in the ecological land. And the human activity sort of focused, as it would, on the economic landscapes. And they found this other uh, counterintuitive fact that was that it was possible to increase productivity by reducing the area in cultivation. Yeah. Yeah. So that's... You know, if you if you start to look at say sub-Saharan Africa, different places. I mean, Ethiopia would be a tr prime example. You know, there's extensive agricultural systems that are just crap. You know, you there's no reason to to do that because you can concentrate the agriculture and use if you certainly organics and permaculture would be per preferable to anything else. But if you if you just release that area to to ecology, you'll get a, a good result. And maybe it's beavers. I mean, in Russia, for instance, you see this coming back with the beavers coming back. And so those areas where nature's just going to do its thing anyway, like you're saying, we're just, we've been getting in its way. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you a perfect example of where it wasn't even separated. Uh, Gabe and Paul Brown have a, a cattle, livestock, and, and row crop chicken, and they've just added uh, sheep to their operation in Bismarck. And they've been working with the Audubon Society and there's just been this concern of when the birds nest in the, in, the, in the fields, the cows can't be there. You know, and you gotta separate those two things. What they've discovered is the cows avoid the nest. 
the cows do it themselves. The nesting's happening right in the field that the cows are grazing, and they're just walking around it, and the nesting's happening just fine. Of course, with properly grazed situations, not with overgrazed situations. I wanted to open it up to the audience. Um, I don't know if there's a mic that goes around. If there's not, you guys can use mine, so just come up here if you want to ask a question. Um, and while you're thinking whether you want to ask a question, I'll ask the next question. Um, what's, what are you most excited about right now with what's happening in this whole field? Like, what's the thing that you're like, well, this could really kick in, or, or look at that. I, who would have thought that those folks would be working with me? You know, anything like that? Um, you know, when you say the most exciting things, probably the most exciting thing that we're trying to do to move all of this along is to teach people how to observe their own microorganisms. And so we can teach you in a two-day period of time. You can get a very inexpensive but very good microscope for about $300. You can get your own microscope, come and work with us for a day. And so now you start monitoring your own soil and figuring out who's missing in your food web, what's not in your garden soil, what's not in your lawn, what's not in your flower beds. And as we shift that um, strictly bacterial dominated soil into more and more fungal, we are following the normal course of natural succession. And we get rid of the weeds because the truly weedy species are very early succession disturbance requiring. And we can jumpstart that system and jump you from bare soil into um, a very productive grassland in a, within the first growing season. Um, working with uh, people down in uh, Melbourne. Uh, we even uh, went out and started making compost on their own property from their waste manure. So instead of the manure going into the lagoons, instead of the liquids going out and being stored and that nitrate destroying the fertility of the land, if you spray that directly onto your pastures, you use all of that to make your own compost. And then they're putting that compost right out on their soil. And the very first growing season, we will reduce the cost of um, the whole farm operation by $200,000 in a 300-acre farm. So the first year that we worked in uh, just outside of Melbourne, uh, there were three farmers, three dairy people that was working with us. It went to five people the next year, 75 people <clears throat> the next year. And uh, now we're working with close on to 1,000. Um, dairy people in that uh, southwestern corner. From down literally there starting with three, three yep. farmers? And three that was just farmers. word of mouth, or was that you having a great marketing person, or how did that happen? That was people who had heard me and wanted to start moving things up. They were so close to bankrupt, uh, you know, if they hadn't started working with us, they were just going to declare bankruptcy. All of their animals were sick. The cost, the EPA had come out and threatened to. Uh, ticket them, you know, a fifteen thousand dollar fine per day for the way they were storing their manures in the pits, which is how their Department of Agriculture had told them to do it. And so they were just, I mean, it was catastrophic for them. And yet we turned them around in the first growing season, and all the neighbors watch and look. And of course, this whole system incorporates the mob grazing. It's doing exactly, you know, on the pasture system what Alan's been talking about for years, combine that with the biology and how are you going to get those organisms back out onto the property, and we reduce their cost by $200,000 <clears> Excuse me. in the first year. The second year, we increased the amount, and the year after that, we increased. And so <clears throat> they, most of them have uh, taken that extra money and put in swimming pools. <laughs> <laughs> So they're making the money. They can send their kids to college. They can do special things now because they're not going to lose their farm. Thanks. So those success stories yeah. are, what, you know, that's the information we need to get out to everybody that look what's possible. That's what I'm going to ask all of you is the success stories because I think that's the most powerful thing and a lot of you are storytellers. So Courtney, tell us some of the success stories, success stories that excite you the most or the one or... Well, um, maybe a, 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 there's a whole bunch of them to choose from. Maybe the farming. You just wrote a whole let's, book let's on do it, farming instead of ranching for a second. There's a, in the book I profile a young guy named Dorn Cox, who's a who's a farmer out in New Hampshire, uh, and just a, a super interesting person as well. He uh, 
This is an organic 250-acre uh, farm uh, in southern New Hampshire. His parents bought, and they converted from a degrading, probably chemically intensive farm to a biologically healthy one. But Dorn, he was told report, uh, over and over again by his friends and family that there's no future in farming. So he got out, and he left. He went to Wall Street and became a, a suit on Wall Street, as he puts it. And, uh, it only lasted for a year. I mean, he was in the kind of ag sort of the global agricultural business community. He got out of it. He went into software, uh, traveled around, uh, and decided that that wasn't what he wanted to do. He wanted to be a farmer again. But he came back to the farm, and uh, what he did when he came back is, been, is, is really really interesting. He brought back systems theory, how to manage complex systems. He says. Uh, that farming isn't rocket science, it's more complex than that, actually. And he, uh, and it's a very, so he calls himself a carbon farmer. He uh, actually was doing his PhD work when I met him, uh, trying to tr convert uh, hay fields behind professors' houses into productive farms by no-tilling, by organic no-tilling, but also by he, he floats balloons and he takes uh, photos down of, um, Oh, different kinds of imagery. So he's using low-tech um, imaging to, to kind of look at the soil and a bunch of other things, uh, sort of the, uh, on the organic side of things. But at the same time, he brought the open source software knowledge that he has. There's, it, there's six farms around him. They uh, invented a biodiesel thing using an old Coke truck you know, with the doors that go up and down. Uh, but they didn't patent it. They didn't make it proprietary. He actually very consciously sets him, himself and his generation against his parents who did proprietary things and tend to sue each other and things like that. And he said, absolutely not. All the farms are open source. They trade everything. He started a group called FarmHack. Have you heard of FarmHack? FarmHack.com. So, FarmHack.com. This is, uh, Dorn was one of the founders of it. Uh, it's basically a virtual coffee shop, a co coffee house where both beginning farmers and folks who have questions, they literally, I've got this piece of equipment, I don't know what it is, have anyone seen it before? And they share stories back and forth. It's grown a lot, actually, over the years. But again, it's, it's that blend of um, old farming knowledge, so organic farming, with new tech, with the way he's sort of uh, analyzing and thinking about soils and, and biology and things like that, and, uh, with the internet with the uh, open source uh, community using, um, as he said, I need computing power to, ma to manage my farm. I need to be able to crunch the numbers, the data that comes in. And he has, you know, he's, he's of that generation that just can do all that, all that complex stuff. And it's, he's growing strawberries. And he started grains. He's the, it was the first, started a grain cooperative in New Hampshire. He's trying, his ultimate goal is to get New Hampshire to feed itself again. It used to, once upon a time, and now it doesn't. Uh, but he, uh, he's a leader. But you see, he brought all that kind of stuff together uh, under one 250-acre uh, farm. Um, he calls it abundance thinking. He says that we're, we're kind of confined by scarcity thinking. Everything's scarce, and we fight for these scarce resources. He says, uh, let's try abundance thinking. What's more abundant than soil? And it's just a whole different way of looking at the world. And it's, it's really quite exciting. And he's speaking at Kibera this year. And he's speaking, he's coming, he was at our carbon conference that Seth was at. He's going to come back this year. Our theme this year is Back to the Future. He's going to come and talk about farm hack and, mm -hmm. and what, um, using the internet to, to push forward sustainable food production. And that idea of open source is not new. Uh, ben Franklin refused to patent anything <laughs> he invented as well. And I'm wearing bifocals, so thank you, Ben. Um, let's go through and get these success stories that really help you sleep at night. So, Seth? Uh, you know, I'll just be real quick. A, a few on the ground, but then some in the, in the sort of in the intellectual space. Um, on the ground, uh, um, I just know what's going on in, in Zimbabwe because I've been there. Um, and I just wish more people knew about that, you know. And, um, you, you know, you, you've seen those pictures. I'm sure a lot of you have seen those pictures, those sort of before and after pictures. But when you're standing there, you know, it just becomes very... That's the, success, that's the personal success story. You feel it in your body. Um, and, and I know that because of the hubs that are happening now and the interest, it, it's all... Uh, it, I can tell that the idea is catching on and, and that, that's exciting. Um, 
I just want to say something in terms in the intellectual space in terms of a success story. You know, I'm I'm seeing more papers coming out. You mentioned one that was contrary, but I'm seeing more that are coming out that are that are quite supportive. Um, um, Greg Retallick of the University of Oregon, I believe. My apologies if I'm not getting the university right. Greg Retallick. Greg Retallick um, has a paper. Um, where he, he's, his thesis is that the evolution of grasslands was instrumental in the planetary cooling of the last 50 million years, um, and that it can be again. This is a very powerful academic paper. The conventional theory is that the planet cooled and dried and then the grasslands adopted. He's saying, no, it's the other way around. The grasslands took over, which made the planet get cooler and drier. We used to be a hotter, wetter planet. I mean, those two things were happening at the same time. The planet was getting cooler and drier in the grasslands, but that is, it's very powerful that this type of thinking is, is going on in academia. And then also, um, you know, so uh, just a plug for our conference. So there's a, there's a conference called um, um, uh, Restoring Ecosystems to Reverse Global Warming that, that my group is helping to put on. But the, the feedback I get from academics when I, at, when I invite them to participate, they're like, oh, thank you. No, you can, you can, you can feel it, that the academics want to be asked to, be, to participate in a conversation that's positive about biology in, in climate, and not just reporting on the casualties. And, and so that, to me, is a success story. That's huge. <clears throat> Judith? Um, I'll, I'll build on that and just say that a year ago, I. Oh, that was the conference, that panel that you and I were on together in Washington, which was called, Can a Reinvented... Can Agriculture Be the Solution? Or yeah, something yeah, yeah. Like, can, at the New American can, can Foundation. A, yeah, right. And, then, and, and the, pro, the, the thought, the notion that agriculture could be part of the solution was so kind of against what anyone was thinking that Including it was... Including the moderator. Yeah, yeah. indeed, indeed. <laughs> but then... The last time I saw you at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs Symposium on Food Security, the discussion proceeded as if that were already a given, that agriculture could be part of the solution. And people were talking about healthy soil. People were talking about nutrition in terms of quality and not just calories. And even a few times, some of the people who I least would have expected it from mentioned the term soil carbon. So I am seeing that happen. I do think that my profession, the, the media, needs to get on board with this because really, it is, I'm always fighting to try to get my pieces with these, this perspective into publications and if I were to pitch an article called Why Climate Change Will Mean More Bad Hair Days, I could sell it. <laughs> Absolutely. Do it. Do it. I mean, that could supplement the, for your book. Exactly. Right? That'll pay for the other work I'm doing. Totally do but it. right, yeah. the, the, the looking at whole systems. Anyway, it's been an uphill battle, but obviously things are coming around. You know, that model of the, you know, like Nicolas Cage doing the big action films so he can do the small little Hollywood films that he really wants to do, the little independent films, maybe? Should That's right. That? Under a pseudonym, maybe. Yeah, well, yeah, maybe. <laughs> John, down the same road of uh, success stories, things that uh, you're really excited by? Well, I think the thing that most excites me, I've been fortunate, I'm grateful to be here, and uh, I do some public speaking and speaking in universities in different parts of the world. And I've had the opportunity to, now to speak in every continent. And in the Middle East, and in Asia, and in Russia, and in Europe, and in Africa, and in North and South America, there's a total acceptance of the concept that it's possible to rehabilitate the Earth. And this is what brings humanity together. It involves everyone. And it's what we want, it's what we aspire to. So let's do this, you know, that's, that is, is the thing I think that's so exciting. And the, if, if we can reach this point where we are 
um, creating a new cultural narrative that is acceptable to everyone and stop all the things that we disagree about and just find what we agree on. This is, I think, the way forward and I, I see it. It's happening. We're at this moment. So either we will do that or we'll fail. So. If you're, are you a betting man? <laughs> um, not, not generally, no. But if you were, are you, are you betting on us well, doing the right yeah, thing? Yeah, I think you, you should bet the farm on this one. <laughs> <laughs> nice. How are we doing on tiempo? So we have 10 minutes left. Really? You had a question. Okay, I thought you did, and then you sat down. So. Wait, 10 minutes total? Here we go. To a break. To the break. break. My name is Ricardo Aguirre. I actually have two questions, one for Judith and then the next for Dr. Ingram. So I'm a flood control engineer in the arid southwest, and I'm very aware of uh, our standards in engineering. And they're set up such that it's essentially cookbook engineering. How do you propose that we reach out to legislation, uh, local governments, to begin to change uh, development standards so that we can do more than one function, which is flood control, and begin to save this water because like you, I understand where you're coming from and use it for reversing desertification. Then should I ask the next question? Yes, yeah, so that's question one for Judith. Now question two for Elaine. Question two for Elaine is, I wrote a paper uh, to the city of Phoenix to divert that portion of organic material from their landfill uh, to pyrolyze and make biochar. You'd indicated earlier in your opening comments that the compost from the landfill is really a putrefied organic matter. So as as the city has actually accepted my paper, I'm now engaged with the city and ASU. I wanted to know if you have any recommendations on what we can do with that material to you know, send it into the agrarian environments or anything else. So those are my two questions. Okay, cool. And just to say it, I'm at ASU, so let's chat afterwards. Okay, great. Awesome. Thank you. So Judith, you first. I would say for something like that, an economic argument would be effective if you could broaden the time frame because um, it just it makes me think of someone that I interviewed for, for my book who realized that they were solving the same problem again and again and again and it was adding up and if they looked at the root cause which was the condition of the soil they actually didn't have to bring that, that particular technical technological solution. I, I can't remember exactly what it was. It was something to do with gullies or flooding. So if you broaden the time frame just a little bit, you'll find that addressing the system is more cost effective. Yeah, and I, I would suggest, you know, in the, on, the, on the watershed level, um, and I mean, the soils are so hard in so much of Arizona right now. So when it does rain, a lot of it's just lost. So if we could get those soils able to soak up the water and then recharge the groundwater. I mean, every river in Arizona used to flow. Yeah. Well, on a policy level, that's what I would propose, but that would mean we'd have to get into an intergovernmental agreement with the local government, well, that's, the land departments. And exactly. Well, that's what John was saying. You have to look at the system of people. That's what Alan's been saying. You have to look at the whole system of the whole thing and show that the rancher and the cotton farmer and the solar developer are all working on the same system, and if they worked in concert together, then you actually would get towards solutions. And that's the question. What is the specific approach to get the audience of these light? Free beer. Free beer. <laughs> Free beer. That's how you get them together. That's, Elaine? That's not a bad idea. Okay, the, the question was about biochar, if I understood. Yeah, the putrid, about how uh, the city landfill is, is putrid and bleh, and is, is it always that way? And then he wanted to know the well, biochar. Let me, let me sort of say what you're saying, because this is being web streamed and we can't hear you. So basically, the, the biochar is improving the waste stream, and, and you're asking her just to comment on... on to, comment on to comment on, and how can we move it into markets like the agrarian markets? Okay, so how do you get that going? Do you, what do you think of biochar? Well, um, 
I think we have to be very careful with biochar because I've um, experienced a lot of materials that people have used to make biochar that have ended up with a material that is so toxic. It would kill the plants in the system and prevent the plants from growing for a very long time. The toxicity so, lives through pyrolysis? Yes. Okay. And in the process of pyrolysis, you may even develop some toxic materials that you did not have before. So we need more regulation on that. You can't just start off with any old thing. You have to be very careful what you're pulling out of the landfill. You can't just throw, you know, it is computers. garbage in, garbage out. And so being careful with the biochar then. Now it is a crystallized material. It does not contain life. All of the organisms are killed in the py pyrolysis process. So you're left with some really good chunky stuff. Mix that into your dirt and you're gonna allow more oxygen to move into that dirt. But with the first rainfall, if you're truly dealing with dirt, with the first rainfall, with the first irrigation, all of that just collapses right back down and you're right back at the equally as horrible compacted condition that you were probably in before you started. You have to take that biochar and you've got to get the organisms back into the biochar. So how are you gonna do that? Well, you're gonna make some compost, properly made aerobic compost that has all the beneficial organisms in it, the bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods, mycorrhizal fungi, a <laughs> few microarthropods in there too. So, it takes four to six weeks for delivery. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, you soak your biochar in that material. You get all these great, wonderful little microorganisms in the condominium housing that's, in, that's present in that biochar. And now you put that biochar into the soil. So the second that biochar, you know, till it in, till it down below your compaction layer. So you break that up. And now all those organisms start coming out of the condos. Mom and dad, bacteria, or fungus says, yeah, okay, I've gotten you to 17 years old out. You leave now. And they go out and they colonize the soil. They build structure. They do the nutrient cycling. They do the protection of your root systems. We make certain that all the critters running around on the surface of the soil climb your plant and now you're protecting the above ground part of your plant. So the biochar is a perfect vehicle for moving those microorganisms from a compost into the soil. Well, compost is also a really good vehicle. It's that quite often compost has uh, been decomposed down to really small chunk size. So maybe adding the biochar into the compost pile means that biochar has all the organisms in it, and why not put both the compost and the biochar? So we've got some experiments that need to be done. Which one's gonna be most effective under which conditions? And you know, do you really have to be doing biochar and compost back into a perfectly healthy soil? No. You just have to feed a perfectly healthy soil. You've got to have the organic matter going back into the system. Next question. Hi. Mine's actually, I wanted to answer a question you proposed to the panel. You said, how do you convince someone that the organic is better? Like, is it truly better? Um, my name's Christian Tanzi. Um, and to John's point, I'm actually betting the farm on this space. I'm, I am a gambling man. <laughs> I uh, have spent the last eight years trading derivatives uh, the last six in London, and I've decided to enter this space. So uh, I think this is the future. But the, to answer that question, uh, yes, there's actually a study that was a couple of weeks old uh, published in the British Journal of Nutrition. It was a joint study between Washington State University and uh, University of Newcastle here in the UK, and they basically showed, uh, I think it was a meta-analysis, that yes, organically raised crops contain more antioxidants and less toxins. And, uh, and then there's the study in health of epigenetics that uh, yes, some people are genetically disposed to cancer or dis disorders, but you can control the output of your genes through nutrition. And I think these are points we need to make up. As someone who just had a child, uh, I didn't have a child, my wife had a child. We were very particular in what we ate and because uh, we wanted to, you know, build the best baby. And I think people will start looking at this like, okay, that tomato is cheaper, but is it really the, the conventional tomato? And, and I think we need to, 
to Alan's point, the holistic cost. Like, yes, that tomato is cheaper to buy, but looking at a holistic system, is it really more? No, it, if we bring in the health costs, so. Awesome. So, so, so what you're saying is the consumer is going to be a big driver, and you're a consumer. And that paper that you read, uh, that you mentioned, I read it, I read the New York Times synthesis of that paper, and what they said was the organic food was higher in antioxidants because plants produce antioxidants as pest control, and if you're not using a lot of herbicides, then the plant will produce the antioxidants as pest control. Is that? So there's some system stuff humming in right there. So we're, we're at time. Um, I wanted to get everyone, you know, talking about what they're really excited about, because to me that's, that's what drives me, and I'm sure it's what drives you all. You're in this because you love it. You know, you've just spent two, three years finding stories, and, and everyone's been inspired, and that's why we're here, and everyone's sort of had a shift or a change or a number of little small shifts. Um, so unless there's not another question from the audience. Oh, Graham, come on. Well, wait, where have you guys been? We're, we're, coming, been... we're coming back, aren't we? I'm sorry? No, no. This was already the two units, oh. two time units. Oh. Graham, Graham, come on. Come on. Very, very quick statement. Graham Harvey, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. I particularly just want to address this to Elaine. I mean, people were writing about this 50 years ago, and you know, Albert Howard and his books about you know, how plants uh, take up nutrients and so on with the aid of microorganisms and uh, buscular mycorrhiza. And we had all the possibility then of making real food and real sustainable farming. And we went down the road of scientific farming instead, which I think is a great tragedy, but I'm so delighted that you're thinking those ways now. So that's it. Thanks. That was just a kudo. Are there, are there, yes, sir. Can I just start from here? My no, because your, your mic. But then you could repeat it. Peter. Come on up. No, that's OK. All right. <laughs> it's for the shot, too. They'll see a back of a head. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Here you go, sir. Uh, I, I just wanted to say that's the most interesting conversation I've heard for a long time. Sorry. You need to repeat that, by the way. Sorry. I, I, I apologize to you, sir. I should have jumped up and given you the mic. Here we go. Question? Thank you. My question is for Dr. Ingham, but it may be applicable to others as well. You mentioned earlier that if you take on some compost, you can build soil extremely quickly. So I was hoping you could compare and contrast efficacy between building soil from compost-based methods versus holistic management-based methods, not only at the level of the, the beginning part of the soil at first 18 inches, but the true carbon sequestration, as I understand it, that sticks around for a long time below 18 inches. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Soil is not in any way just 18 inches. Yes. Yeah, so exit that one from your mind. Um, how far down does soil go? Well, what is soil? Sand, silt, clay, the mineral particle, the organic matter, which is what's going to feed your microorganisms, and of course, soil has to include organic matters as defined by the father of soil science, Hans Jenny. So as long as you have all of those components, you're dealing with soil. How far down in the planet's surface does soil go? 16 miles deep down into the soil. Now, your roots aren't going to go that far down, but you know, they're gonna, they want to grow down through soil that has the proper structure, has the proper set of organisms, to be doing that nutrient cycling, to be protecting those root systems. So how fast can we build that? Well, in holistic management, we're going to take a little bit, perhaps a slower uh, rebuilding process, because how long does it take for our animals to move the manure around or get those organisms moved around, push it into the soil? It's going to take a while. When you say a while, um, it could take as long as uh, three years, five years, okay. 15 years. I mean, we work in places in Oregon where um, damage was done um, 55 years ago. And despite the fact that we've got hooved animals moving through there, we've got the um, ungulates, um, it's still a weed field. 55 years of weeds. Why hasn't it proceeded through succession? 
And so sometimes we don't understand why things get stuck. Yellowstone National Park. Um, some areas of the park were turned into glass. In the last um, devastating fire, uh, the soil, the fire burned so hot that it melted the silica in the soil. Two years ago was the first time we saw any plant growing in some of those areas. But some places, it, within just a, a year or two, back we're coming the conifers, we're now basically dealing with on our way to an old growth forest. We don't understand everything yet. But if we use compost, properly made compost that has all of these sets of organisms in it, and we get that compost back into the soil, and sometimes we till it to break up a compaction layer because it's really hard for the organisms at the surface to get down to a compaction zone and start building structure and loosening in the soil and getting normal water movement through that profile and so on and so on. So it can take a while. But if we actually till that compost in, if we don't have a compaction layer, yeah, fine. Put the compost on the top, the organisms will move through. But that tillage, that one time last tillage, so you don't ever have to till again, requires getting those organisms into the soil and compost is probably the only way to do that. So there's a group called the Marin Carbon Project. Um, and so they're doing Alan's work and the compost together. And that's where they're finding the most robust carbon sequestration, and they're measuring a meter down. And so the heavy fraction is building quite a bit. And what they found was once they've had what they're calling a state change, that the compact, the, the plow pan is actually dissolving. They're not having, they used the yeoman plow, but they found that that actually released CO2. And so with the compost and the grazing together, they're finding that it's actually dissolving that plow pan straight, straight like that. Because it is the microorganisms that build structure. Yep. The bacteria make the microaggregates, the fungi take the microaggregates, the bacteria build and bind them and tie them into macroaggregates. So the fungi are building the, the brick house in your, in your soil, and the fungi are what decides where the windows and the doors and the walls and how tall is the room going to be or how short or how wide. Structure is built by microorganisms. And the higher level predators, they decide where the furniture is going to go inside each one of those rooms. So it's really necessary to have the whole set of organisms present so we don't ever have compaction again. Yeah. I think John? I, I visited the Marin Carbon Project and uh, John Wick and the other people who are doing that work. And Wendy Silver leads the science at UC Berkeley with Rebecca Riles. Yeah. Yeah. And what's, what's exciting about this is they make a one-time application, yeah. but they get a continuous increase in carbon year by year. They're on year five right now. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, very exciting so development. The benefit is they're making compost from dairy waste within the area of the ranch that they're working on. So you need to have the compost production near where you're spreading it so you don't have that carbon intensity of getting it hundreds of miles away, that kind of thing. They're also using human manure. Yeah. So they're working on literally composting human waste. Um, what's, difference, what's the difference between human manure and cow manure? Come on. Hey, uh, it's I don't mind stepping in cow manure. <laughs> <laughs> um, Pharmaceutical are pharmaceuticals. Make of any microbes? Yeah, pharmaceuticals. Yeah, their composting is actually... Uh, degrading the pharmaceuticals that are in the human waste, and it's, it's breaking that down. They've also got a, a, a chip um, Fire innovation. Fire with, chip. Yeah, the Ther it's thermophile. Quite extraordinary. Yeah, it's cool so, stuff. So, Marin Carbon Project, highly recommend checking those folks out. As long as you have good biology, there is no pharmaceutical that the microorganisms can't decompose. If you properly compost aerobic conditions, we will get rid, rid of the GMO sequences from the genetically engineered plant material. If you're anaerobic, you cannot decompose those sequences. We don't make the, an the enzymes under anaerobic conditions to get rid of that genetically engineered and, material. So, so aerobic is oxygen. And the pathogens, the weed seeds, the, all of that. Aerobic is oxygen, anaerobic yep. is no oxygen. Right. So um, is it the temperature that gets rid of the GMO sequences and the pathogens? It's the growth of the specific organisms. Okay. Now for the pathogens, for the weed seeds, for the pests, the bad guys, the root feeding nematodes, it is temperature. Mm -hmm. And so you have to get it up high enough, long enough. So you need both. Yeah. And you if, need oxygen and you, temperature. Right. Okay. So if you want to learn about that, come and spend yeah, a Yeah, I was going to say, we're, we're jumping me. on you. So, uh, no, spend a couple of days with you is, is the whole point. <laughs> um, 
How much does that cost for you to come by? Where should I do that? Yeah, how much does it cost for you to come by for two days? Um, it would like cost for Greg and Jan <laughs> Judy that you just were at their, their farm in, in it's a, Missouri. It's $3,000, so mm -hmm. it's a $1,500 a day plus a plane fare to get me there, room mm -hmm. and board while I'm there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to support me while I'm teaching. That's pretty reasonable. And do you, do you have an ROI figured out for those operations? ROI. Return on investment. <laughs> oh, goodness. Three days? Four days? The farm. <laughs> yeah. uh, Saving them from going out of bankruptcy? Yeah. 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 I mean, That's it, what's it's happening. Like the place I've quantified this is in Australia working yeah. with Camper Down Compost. $200,000 in the first growing season. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we've Money got well you back to a condition of health. As they say in London, good value for... For, for the dunk, for the dunk. bang for, for the, the buck. Yes, of course. I, I, I was in Australia at a, a carbon conference where a rancher got up and described himself as a radical carbon farmer. He changed his definition of a stocking rate from 40 to 1 to 5 million to 1 or 5 billion to 1. It was just a great way of looking at <laughs> yeah. the stocking rate. You could just put so much more, so many more animals in so much right, less space. Right, right. I'm, 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 we're wrapping up. I'll uh, just stay tuned because what I was about to say, I'll say in the next time I'm on stage. Um, <laughs> So thank you all very much. As you know, these fine folks are going to be in other panels. Uh, we're all book around for the next signing. two days. Book signing is going right. to happen. Mm -hmm. Tea is happening out there. And thank you very much. <laughs>